My name is Robert Eccles. Today is September 14, 2018, and I'm in Nashville, Tennessee to interview Lamar Alexander. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. State your full name, please. Andrew Lamar Alexander, Jr. And state your date of birth and place of birth. July 3rd, 1940. The exact place was Fort Sanders Hospital in Knoxville because uh, they didn't have a hospital in Maryville then, but our family was living in Maryville. Tell me the names of your paternal grandparents, that is, your father's parents, and where they lived. William Henry Alexander. He was born in Loudoun, which is next to Blount County. He's a farmer, um, born 1869, um, and uh, he lived there um, until my father was a teenager, and then they moved into Maryville uh, because so, so my, he sold his farm, moved into Maryville so my dad could go to Maryville High School. He and then, he then uh, lost, uh, he, he lost his farm, I think, during the Depression, and he sold uh, ice and coal in Maryville. He married Lydia Ann Mills, who was from uh, the Friendsville area in Loudoun. She was a Quaker, and she was, that, that was my parents, my father's grandparents, my father's parents. Yeah. Okay, now tell me the names of your maternal grandparents, that is your mother's parents, and yeah. where they live. My mother's father was named Rue Raymond Rankin. Uh, he was one of 18 children born in uh, Jefferson County, Tennessee. He, he was, his father had two wives. Well, not at the same time. He, one died, then he had another eight children. Granddad was in the second pack of children. And that family kind of fell apart. And he ran away from home when he was a teenager and ended up in Texas as a cowboy. And uh, he was about 16 then. Then he lived in Newton, Kansas. He was a railroad engineer, so we called him R. R. Rankin, Railroad Rankin. And he was my very special um, relative. He eventually moved back to East Tennessee, lived in Maryville. Um, I mean, I'm basically, I am a seventh generation East Tennessee and on both sides, but granddad made a trip through Texas and Oklahoma to get back. On that trip, he met my grandmother, who was born in Cassville, Missouri. Her name was was um, Florence Edens, and her mother was named Tennessee Van Zant because she, her parents had moved from Tennessee and they were homesick, so they named her Tenny. Um, and they they married in Cassville, Missouri, and and moved back to Tennessee, and she died in in Maryville. So my parents and those grandparents are all buried in Grandview Cemetery and outside Maryville. Well, let's uh, ask, uh, talk about your dad. What was your father's name and uh, where he lived and his date of birth? Andrew Lamar Alexander was his name, November 15, 1907. And he, he was born on a farm uh, on the Little Tennessee River in Loudoun, Loudoun County, near National Campground. It became National Campground, which was a place where they had camp meetings in the summer and people would come and, and there'd be preachers and it was a great form of entertainment. Well, wh what was his business or occupation? He was, he was a teacher. He was principal of Westside Elementary School. He graduated from Maryville College. It took him a while because his father had gone broke and he had to pay off some debts. So it took him a while. But he, he used to walk to Allen Wick Elementary School and back, became principal of Westside Elementary School. One of his students was Roy Kramer, the Southeastern Conference Commissioner. Uh, at the time. And then when I was born in 1940, um, he was offered a job at the Alcoa Aluminum Plant, which was nearby safety director, and it paid about twice as much, so he took it. Did he have any uh, political or community activities or personal interest? Well, he did. He, he, uh, he and four other people from Maryville uh, formed a ticket in 1945 or 6 after the war and ran for the school board to try to improve the city schools. They were elected for 25 years as a ticket. They hired a professional superintendent and they stuck together and set higher standards. And uh, he was chairman of the Maryville City School Board for, for a while. He was an active Republican. He liked politics. He took me to the courthouse to meet 
Congressman Howard Baker Sr. when I was 10. And I remember Congressman Baker gave me a dime. And I thought I'd met the most important person I was ever likely to meet other than my father and the preacher. And you still remember that? That's, still remember it. That's yeah. wonderful. Uh, what about, uh, what about, did he go to church? Did he have, was he affiliated with uh, religion? New Providence Presbyterian Church. We're, we're, we're a family of Scotch-Irish Presbyterians all the way back. I mean, our family on both sides, the Rankins and the Alexanders, came into Tennessee right after the Revolutionary War in 1783 when, when it opened up and people began to pour in. So Presbyterian. Uh, and and uh, dad was uh, a member of New Providence Presbyterian Church in Maryville and an elder. And you've kept that up. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a member of, uh, of, of another Presbyterian church That's here funny. in Nashville, but, but yes, I have. Okay. Um, tell me uh, some, some more information about your mom, your mother, her name, place, and date of birth, and if she had a business and, or occupation. Well, she was a very complex person, a very strong-willed, uh, interesting person, I, I see as I now look back on it. Um, my dad was the kind of person that everybody loved to see coming and, and popular with, with, with everybody, easygoing in many, many respects. Uh, nothing easygoing about my mother. She, she, was, she was born in Newton, Kansas. My grandfather was an engineer on the Santa Fe Railroad at the time. And, um, and when she was 17, uh, he sent her back to Maryville to go to Maryville College because that's where they were from. And in that first semester in 1931, she met my dad, who uh, some ladies at a nursing home in Maryville told me was the handsomest man on campus. He, he um, sang in a, uh, a glee club or a quartet and uh, they met in that one semester. And then because of the depression, she had to go back to Kansas. And uh, so she was just there that one semester. She then went to uh, Emporia Teachers College in Kansas where her aunt was and she got training to be a teacher, got a certificate. She worked in the summers in Wichita and then she worked in Chicago in the settlement house. She learned all about preschool education and she married my dad in 1939. I think they only saw each other once between 1931 and 1939, but still got married. And uh, when she moved to Maryville, she was a, a different force than most of the people who'd grown up in Blount County. And she really brought to the county uh, uh, preschool education. And she operated in a converted garage in our backyard, a, a uh, nursery school and kindergarten called Mrs. Alexander's Nursery School and Kindergarten. And uh, I still run into graduates of, of, of that kindergarten. And she had 25 three and four year olds in the morning and 25 uh, five year olds in the afternoon. And she did that mostly all by herself, if you can imagine wow. doing that. And how long did she do that? You, About you 30 don't... years, 30, 35 years. When Winfield Dunn was elected governor of Tennessee uh, in 1970, and he began the public kindergarten program in Tennessee, he went there to announce it. Because before then, before about 1970, there was no public preschool education program in Tennessee. All right, I'm now moving to your history and uh, starting with your childhood in uh, Maryville. Uh, first, how, how large is the city of Maryville? Or was it at the well, time? Well, then, either? in 1940, when I was born, it was about 15,000. Yeah. And it was a twin city with Alcoa. The Aluminum Company of America came in in the night, in the it's just before World War I and built this big aluminum smelting plant to make aluminum and rolling plant to roll it out. And the mayor was run out of town, tarred and feathered by people who didn't like the idea of these people coming in from Pittsburgh. But of course what it did was raise the family incomes in a very poor part of, of Appalachia. They were paid at national wage scales. So I grew up in a town, Maryville and Alcoa, where everybody had a job and everybody was middle income and uh, black, white. Uh, I don't remember thinking of anybody as rich and I and I'd hardly met anybody who was poor. Everybody was about, everybody worked at the plant or you know downtown and they seemed to have about the same standard of living. Uh, what about your early growing up? Did you have anything of, 
of notoriety at, at that point? Anything special? <laughs> I, I mean, I guess you played with all the the boy, boys around there yeah. and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Maribel, 121 Ruth Street. I could, um, could elementary school, I went to Westside Elementary School where my dad used to be the principal, that wasn't far away. I went to Maribel Junior High and High School, I could walk to it. Uh, it's about four blocks away. My mother took me to Maryville College when I was four to start piano lessons and I learned to swim there. Maryville College added a lot to our community. Alcoa added a lot because it brought people in who lived all over the world. Was it right in the city, uh, the college? Maryville College is in, in the city and uh, so we had, we had Alcoa and Maryville College just transforming the community during, during the last century. Really, Maryville College is even older than that. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful community in which to grow up because you had uh, calls, my parents' friends, I called them aunt and uncle sometimes, even though they weren't related. They looked after me as much as my parents did. If I got in trouble at school, I got in trouble at home, which I often did. Um, so it was a place, a small town where you could grow up with unlimited horizons and a lot of encouragement. I was very lucky. Now, uh, you didn't have any brothers and sisters at this point, did you? I did. I had two, two sisters, one three years younger, Anne, and one eight years younger, Jane. Well, good. Uh, what about uh, your, you, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, starting the piano lessons at such an early age. Uh, and, uh, and I know that you still play, but uh, how, how intense was that when you started at four years old? And maybe it was, uh, it was common, but I'm, I'm impressed with the fact that you started playing. <laughs> well, you wasn't sneaking out the Pete, window my or friend, something. My friends say to me, well, I did some sneaking out of the window too, but my friends say to me, in fact, I went down to Pistol Creek and smoked Indian cigars, but <laughs> things like that. But my friends today say to me, I wish my mother had made me keep playing the piano. And my answer is, I don't remember having a choice. You know, so I, I, I took lessons until I was 16, until I was a junior in high school, and I was in competitions every year. And I made a deal with my mother. I'd get up in the morning about six. I had a couple of uh, newspaper routes. I'd run my newspaper routes, you know, like at 4 a.m. or 5, and then I'd come back and take a nap, and then I'd get up and practice the piano for 30 minutes, and that was all I had to do. So I, in the afternoon, I could play football or whatever I, whatever I wanted to do. And um, I had a wonderful teacher, and she put me in these annual competitions, and in, my, in high school, I won two statewide uh, piano competitions, the Jayco Cup and the Buxton Cup here in Nashville. Well, I know that you have played before, and uh, so you, I could tell you had a good start and uh, kept with it. Yeah, I, I, I've enjoyed it. I, I mean, as, as governor, I, I, uh, well, I found out I could play by ear, you know, which I didn't think was so special, but not everybody can. It's like repeating what somebody says to you, so I can play what I hear. And um, that, that gives me a lot of enjoyment. So I, can, I was trained to play classical music, but I can play other, other music too. And so when I was governor to try to encourage music in the state, which is, the, I thought, the one thing that unifies us, I got the legislature to, to appropriate some money for endowments for all the community orchestras and symphonies. And then I went around the state and played the piano with them. And, and, I'd play a combination of classical and country music and people would come out to see the governor make a mistake on the piano and it was, it helped raise money for the symphonies and to call attention to music. You know, Nashville is, this, uh, is a music city. Did, have you ever uh, done anything with any of the mus musicians here or, oh. so that you've played with them or d have you made any records, for instance, <laughs> with, well, actually, with or without Actually, anybody? Actually, I, the most recent thing I did was Mike Kerb had Patty Page back. Patty Page sang oh, yeah. the Tennessee Waltz in 1950 sort of the best-selling record ever by a female artist. So if they artist. wanted it, they'd have to go and look yep. for your name on it. Well, but, <laughs> but he, he had her record her songs again, like Mockingbird Hill and those songs. And, and I, played, I played the piano for the Tennessee Waltz on the record. But oh, wow. when I was governor, I played on the opera, op, Grand Ole Opry. Roy Cuff would invite me to do that. Um, 
they haven't asked me to play since I was governor, so it might not have, <laughs> might not have had something to do with my piano playing. The, uh, I met uh, a lot of Chet Atkins, Floyd Kramer, people like that, and I, I did some concerts. I did one concert at East Tennessee State University with uh, Boots Randolph and Floyd Kramer and, and Chet Atkins. So Brenda Lee would come out and help us recruit Japanese uh, industry. She was she was uh, very popular in Japan because she was little and they loved her loved her singing. And so I, I've I've been involved with lots of the music people here. Well, I've I've noticed back when you uh, you're still in politics, but when you were much younger, when you were in politics, uh, you would you could play the piano and you would oftentimes. And uh, some of your other people that you may be uh, against uh, would have someone else come and play. You know that would be part of that, <laughs> and you would sit down and do it all yourself. And I, I suspect that helped you out. Well, it, it came in handy I, when I was uh, there's a dinner in Washington called the Gridiron Dinner. Uh, it used to be a bigger deal than it is now, and all the media, everybody goes, all the big shots, and they have a Republican and a Democratic speaker. Ann Richards was the Democratic speaker, and I thought, oh my goodness, if I'm going to be the Republican speaker, I'll never do better than she did. So I got somebody to help me write some lyrics to country music songs, and I played and sang my speech. <laughs> so it's come in handy at times like that. They were, they were waiting for you and said, I wish you'd yeah. go sit down. I could never have competed with her <laughs> on a speech, but I could play the piano better than she did. Well, good. <laughs> Let's get back to Marvel in just a minute. Uh, I want to ask you about just your 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 uh, your what what you did in high school. That's a big thing for all teenagers coming up. And uh, uh, do you have any officers or, or anything special, athletics or anything else, as you were going to Marvel School? Well, I, um, yeah. I mean, I, I I tried to do everything I could could do. Um, I. I wasn't as good a football player as you were, and I, <laughs> I, uh, and I were, got kicked in the were, eye. I bet you were president. I, 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 <laughs> I was president of the, the class. I was president of my class two or three times, but, <laughs> but I tried to play football. Got kicked in the my my eye, so my right eye doesn't move up or down, and that's been a, a you know ever since I was about thirteen or fourteen years, years old, and uh, so I played basketball. We didn't have a track team. Um, I was governor of Tennessee Boys State, which is where you and I met in 1957, and uh, won the state Voice of Democracy contest. And how many people do you recall that they invited to that uh, uh, that week's period where the boys? The came Boys from State all over the was about 400 and 450 people, all white. It was segregated then, and uh, the the black boys met at another at another place. How did you become uh, president of that that week's uh, Boys State? Because I, I know from your uh, presence uh, and all your other things that you uh, ended up being president of Boys State. Well, you were there and... and uh, I voted for you. Yeah, well, they all said they did, but only won by three votes, so somebody, oh was, somebody I was, was not telling the truth. I was going to ask you that because most people, you know, at that age when you're that... They, you know, people don't want to get into politics too much. Just well, go ahead. I'll do I don't know. You, want. you know, I don't know why I did that. But I got on the bus. There was a bus that picked us up, in Mar and we met in Knoxville. And I remember we stopped and picked up Mike Simmons from Oak Ridge. We were all very jealous because he showed up in a convertible with a pretty girl in it. And <laughs> Oak Ridge was a big high school anyway. And we got to talking on the way down that we hadn't had a governor from East Tennessee. And uh, I'd even printed up some brochures that said, you can go far with Lamar. And, and I recruited three or four of my friends from Knoxville to be in a hillbilly band. And so we entertained and played. And, and, and we had an independent, L.A. Sturdivant, who, from Lytton High School in Nashville, who ran. And he tried to imitate Frank Clement's manner of speaking. And he was very popular. And so I came in first, and he was second. And Carol Coffey from Chattanooga was third. And then I got to go to... Boys Nation that year, they sent two senators. That's a great program. It still goes. I see. Well, I, I, I see. I see the boys and girls from Boys State and Nation every year when they come to Washington, and I often speak at their at their annual meeting sponsored by the American Legion and, and the Auxiliary. Well, I, I remembered that uh, the president 
uh, the, um, the one that's elected president of Boyd State, that at the end uh, gives a speech. And uh, you gave one too, as I recall. I did. And John Maddox from Cookville, who ran Boyd State for a long time, sent me a copy of that speech on its 50th anniversary, which would have been, you know, a few, few years ago, um, uh, 2007. And I was scared to death to see what I might have said <laughs> as a 17-year-old. <laughs> But this, these were some of the things, and I have it on the wall in my office in Washington. 18-year-old vote, that was one of the things I urged. Uh, right to work law, I don't know where that came from, maybe from living around the Alcoa plant, being a Republican family. Um, outlaw the Ku Klux Klan, that was one that of them. Right? And pass civil rights laws. Now remember, this was 1957. This was the year that President Eisenhower sent a National Guard into Little Rock Central High School. A year after, Governor wow. Clement had sent the National Guard into uh, Clinton High School in Tennessee to desegregate it. And it was at a time when Boys State and Girls State were segregated by race. Wow, what a coincidence. Well, I want to move on to your college. And uh, I mean, I know there's lots other there, but uh, I know you went to Vanderbilt. Why did you go to Vanderbilt? Well, my horizons weren't too broad. I, I considered UT, Duke, and Vanderbilt. And um, uh, the tuition was $600 at Duke and Vanderbilt and $200 at UT. And I got a scholarship at Duke for $600. And I wanted to stay in the state, so I called Mr. Buford, who was the admissions director at Vanderbilt, and said, I've got $600 from Duke. Will you match it? <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so he gave me a founder's scholarship so I could go to Vanderbilt, and I had an Alcoa scholarship, which was another 500. And I, I sold cigarettes and magazine subscriptions, and I was the campus correspondent for the Nashville Banner, and I made some money as the newspaper editor. So that's, I went to Vanderbilt to stay in the state because it was a good place and because uh, I could afford it with those scholarships. Did you, uh, did you live in a dormitory? Yeah, lived in Barnard Hall, first year. And uh, second, third, and f I lived in the Sigma Chi house the uh, third and fourth year. Uh, what about uh, roommates? Uh, did you? My main, first year I didn't have one. Bill Mowry of Louisville was my roommate for most of that time. A good guy, he, he had a motorcycle. And um, uh, I would, I was the newspaper editor of what, the Hustler is the name of the newspaper. And uh, so on Wednesday nights, we'd get it all done and I'd have to take it down to the printer. So I'd drive this motorcycle at 3 a.m. in the morning downtown Nashville with all the stuff in the Vanderbilt newspaper and they would, Joby at the printing, at, at Benson's printing would print it. But we, we roomed together three years. And uh, do you have any offices? I said you, you, were, in, you were in a fraternity. Right. Uh, so were you an officer in your fraternity and some other things around yeah. campus? Yeah, I was, I was president of the, of the Sigma Chi and president of ODK, which is, the, which is a leadership group. And um, uh, I was a member of the, student, of, the, of the student senate one year. Uh, what about sports? Well, I was exercising when I was a sophomore on the Vanderbilt track, which was a terrible track. I mean, it was all cinders and holes. And this man was out there with a stopwatch, and he said, run 100 yards for me. And I said, okay. And I did. He said, that's really good. And it was Herc Alley, and he was the Vanderbilt track coach, and he got me to get on the track team. Turns out he had three guys who could run the 100-yard dash in – Nine six, nine seven, and nine five. Good gracious! And, and these are all non-scholarship guys. But he didn't have a fourth, and so I was the fourth guy on this, on this four forty, four, whatever. Four forty yard relay team, yeah. and we set the school record and came in second in the southeastern conference against all these big athletic guys, and that record still stands primarily because they don't have it anymore. It's a four hundred <laughs> meter <laughs> race, yeah. well, was, and not four forty. Yards, but so I was, I was, I had a chance for two years to be on the Vanderbilt track team. Well, that was really fast. It was, too. but but I'll give full credit to the other three. My well, job was to take it from the first guy to the third guy, which is a pretty good lesson 
in life. Well, that that got you <laughs> though is uh, not not only is is uh, get beating all the records before, but you also got uh, in the Vanderbilt. Uh, what do they call that when you're on the? Uh, well, they call it the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame, that's what I'm thinking. I thought that was a pretty generous thing for them to do. I think it had more to do with scholarship than athletics. Well, it may and have. And I invited all the other three guys on the track team to go with me when I got the award because <laughs> they were the ones who were really oh, fast. Oh, well, good. Did, did they do it to other? They had other track uh, members, I would guess, on the track team. Not that year. Oh, okay. Not that year. Yeah. Well, that's good. Let me... Uh, uh, what else in college that you did that uh, that I should ask you about? Well, the summers, I worked uh, a couple of summers. I traveled in Latin America with the National Student Association. Once I went to Cuba, this is right well, after see, Castro I didn't know that, so came I, in. I was... And the next summer, we traveled all over South America, and we got in to see the president. How many of you were there? There were about a dozen. <laughs> we got in to see the president of the country in every case, which, of course, we were young and didn't know every, anything and thought we were important. About 10 years later, I found out that one of our chaperones was a member of the CIA, so I think he had, <laughs> had arranged all the meetings. And that led me to major in Latin American history, uh, particularly because we had a very fine professor named Alexander Marchant, and they started an honors program my senior year, and so I majored in uh, Latin American history. Well, that was a question I had because I didn't see that fit immediately. You know. Well, it was, it was because of the travel and because of the, of the professor. You know, you learn in college, take the professor, not the course, and he was a spectacular person. What else, uh, what else at Vanderbilt that stands out to you as you think back about those days? You didn't know what was going to un unfold no, I did. Later, I, as I, most it, it was people, Vander, but, but Vanderbilt was a, a it was a great ex experience for me. The the one thing that would I graduated Phi Beta Kappa, but the uh, when when I was a senior, an editor of the newspaper, we had a big uh, fight on campus over desegregation of the student body. Vanderbilt was still segregated by race in 1962, and uh, this was a year or so after John Lewis and the sit-ins in downtown. Nashville and the beginnings of the civil rights movement. And I wrote some editorials that said Vanderbilt should be ashamed of that and that we all should be. And I worked the, with the chancellor, Harvey Branscombe, who was going to retire and knew he could not get the right kind of chancellor, who turned out to be Alexander Hurd at Vanderbilt, for a, de for a segregated school. So he worked with me behind the scenes to try to encourage the board of trust at Vanderbilt to change the rules. And we stirred up such a fuss, a bunch of us students, that uh, we had a referendum. And the Vanderbilt student body voted by about three to two to keep the place segregated. But that stirred up such a fuss that it caused the board of trust to have to deal with it in the spring of 1962 and they desegregated the undergraduate school. So looking back on that, that doesn't seem like much today. But in 1962, if you were black and you lived in Tennessee and you wanted to spend the night at a motel, you might have to drive by because sure. they might not take you. If you wanted to go to lunch, you might not be admitted. If you wanted to go to the UT football game, you had to sit in a special section. People forget that. And the indignity of how people had to live then was uh, was was still there, and that was that was a, an important part of my well. When senior I was year. reading up on you, I saw that, and uh, I was not shocked. Huh. Uh, but I, you know, I thought it was something that uh, I was not really surprised. I didn't know about it, so I was surprised in that way. But otherwise, I wasn't, and uh, and that was good. Now, uh, but I do know that you went to law school. Uh, what what turns you in that direction? Well, I was nominated for a Rhodes Scholarship once, and I got to the finals and didn't get picked. And um, and it was late in the year, and I didn't know what to do, and I didn't have any money. And my father, who I th always thought had pre would have preferred to be a teacher, and while he appreciated working at Alcoa for 35 years, he encouraged me not to be part of a corporation. So I, I thought being a lawyer would be a way to be independent. 
And I'd read books about Clarence Darrow. I read Inherit the Wind in his trial, Scopes trial in Ray County. And I, as a youngster, I'd seen in my community the most the people I admired the most included lawyers like Joe Gamble and A.B. Goddard and Houston Goddard, people like that. And, and um, so that led me to law school. Then I found a sort of Rhodes Scholarship for lawyers called the Root Tilden Scholarship at New York University Law School. Well, I had heard of that. Yeah, and, and, uh, and so I applied for that and I was one of two people in this judicial circuit who was selected. My father was very upset. He thought he could not understand why a son of his would go to New York University Law School. And um, uh, when I enrolled there in the fall of 1962, it was my first visit ever to New York City. And I took a bus down to Greenwich Village and looked around and thought, what in the hell am I doing here? You know, this, this all these strange looking people uh, in the line. I'll tell you one short story, waiting to register. There was this tall guy in front of me, and he was, we'd waited a long time to register, and he was upset. I said, what are you upset about? He said, well, I left my money at home. Oh my. And I said, well, where's home? He said, Jersey City. Well, I thought that was hundreds of miles away. And, and I said, well, how much do you need? He said, $300, and I said, I'll loan it to you because we got $500 as Root Tilden Scholars for the year. Was he, plus, was he a utility? Plus, plus we got full scholarship. So I loaned him 300 He thought I was really a hayseed for loaning money to somebody I didn't know because he'd grown up in a rough part of Jersey City, knocking his elbows against the wall, learning to play basketball. And he'd gone to Georgetown where he was captain of the basketball team. He was a Ruth Tilden scholar. His name was Paul Tagdebu. He was later the commissioner of the National Football League. So that's how we met. And as a result, I've been to a lot of Super Bowls, and he's still a pretty good friend. I remember that. Uh, well, that was that was uh, good. Moving from uh, to the law school itself, uh, you had a scholarship, and you've told us about this uh, fellow that you mentioned. What about the other merits, if any, that you had uh, while you were in law school? Well, they took the first twenty out of a class of 300 for the law review, and I was 21st. So the second year I was in law school, I wrote, my, we had a writing competition, I wrote my way onto the law review for the third year. I wrote a, a, a note called, In-Bank Hearings in the Federal Courts of Appeal. So I read all of the in-bank hearings that existed at that time and wrote two notes about it, NYU Law Review, so I was on the law review. and. Uh, I wish I hadn't spent so much time studying because there was so much to see and do and, at, uh, you know, in New York City that I missed a lot of it. But that, that's what I did. In the summers, um, first summer in 1963, Beth Hale, a Vanderbilt classmate, was Robert Kennedy's assistant and I wrote her and I got a job in the summer as an intern in the Department of Justice. And that was a good experience and one afternoon in August of that summer I went downstairs and there was a huge crowd and I heard Martin Luther King give his I have a dream speech and the next summer um, Frank Wheat who was the commissioner of the Security and Exchange Commission was recruiting at, at, at NYU Law School and he recruited both Paul Tagliabue and me roommates to go to Los Angeles to work with Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. And we said, we don't want to work in California, Mr. Wee. He said, oh, you come on out, you will, after you go. So we went, and we took our round-trip plane ticket. We cashed it in, rented a red convertible, and we drove to uh, <laughs> Los Angeles and had a good time in the summer. And uh, Gibson, Dunn was about 40 lawyers then. I don't know how many today, maybe 2,000. But that was that, that, was that summer. Well, you got uh, introduced to the law. Uh, did you intend to practice law? Yeah, yeah, you I did. To be a lawyer, I, would I, I did. Suppose. I did. The uh, my senior year, uh, Dean McKay came by and said, "Judge John Minor Wisdom of New Orleans wants a second law clerk, but he only has the authority to hire one, and he'll pay you." as a messenger, which he does have the authority to hire, he'll treat you like a law clerk and pay you like a messenger if you want to apply for the job. 
Well, Judge Wisdom was one of the most distinguished members of the federal judiciary. And I applied for the job and in the August of 65, I went to New Orleans and I worked for Judge Wisdom in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals for a year as his messenger law clerk. And true to his word, he treated me um, like a law clerk. And uh, what did you do at night? <laughs> well, now, I, got I, I got tired, you know of, making, I, I got tired of making $300 a month. <laughs> And so I went down on Bourbon Street and looked for a job, and I found a, uh, I went to your father's mustache, which was a sort of a beer joint where they had a banjo band, and, and they have a banjo and a tuba and a trombone. And so I played down there three or four nights a week for whomever was off. So I played the trombone and the washboard, you play that with a spoon, <laughs> and um, there. And one night we had the entire Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals down there, and they're all looking very uncomfortable except for Judge Wisdom, who loved to have a good time, and he, he was there. That court, by the way, was very important. It presided over the desegregation of the South. There were appointees by President Eisenhower, Wisdom, Judge, Re Judge Tuttle of Atlanta, John Brown of Texas. And if, if, because Eisenhower was a Republican president, the Democratic segregationist senators couldn't block their, their confirmation by the Senate. And so you had three Republican judges plus Truman's nominee, Judge Reeves, who desegregated the South during the 50s and 60s, ordered James Meredith to be uh, admitted to Ole Miss. And if they hadn't been there, I'm sure that the desegregation of the South, particularly in public education, would have taken a lot longer than it did. I'm, I'm sure. Did you, uh, did you, did, when did you take the bar exam? Did you take that while you 1965. were? 1965. Was that? Uh, after, I, after, after I graduated from law school. Okay. Before I went to see Judge Wisdom. All right. Uh, what, what was your first, uh, employment after you uh, finished with New Orleans? Well, I uh, Howard Baker. I came back to Knoxville and um, I, I, I'd volunteered for... Did you, did you know uh, the senator? No, I didn't know him. Uh, I, I'd met his father, as I said, when I was 10, and I, I was impressed with him. He was young. He wanted to build a two-party system, so I wrote him and volunteered while I was in New Orleans, never heard from him. I went to see him at the Easter vacation and I was expecting to see this great big Howard Baker machine since I'd been reading about them all my life. And I went into an office and found Ruthie Edmondson from Maryville and Bill Hamby from Oak Ridge. And in the back room, there was this clatter and noise. And it was Victor Ash from Knoxville, who was a Yale law student typing out press releases. And that was the whole Baker machine. So when I came back in August after the primary, uh, I worked for Senator Baker, for Howard Baker's campaign. He won in November of 1966, became the first Republican senator ever elected by the people from Tennessee, and I went to Washington with him as his legislative assistant. Wow. Uh, well, I have now a I'd worked Now, I'd worked during that time for Fowler, Roundtree, uh, Fowler, and Robertson, um, very fine Knoxville law firm that I'd, that I'd worked for uh, in the summer and then for a while then. And I remember Mr. Harley Fowler telling me, he said, if you go to Washington, you'll never come back. So I did come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think you made a wise choice because <clears throat> you learned to play softball up there. Well, I wasn't. <laughs> I I'm did. being facetious. No. Tomorrow, well, but and, and you, I, you and, met someone that's very, very uh, dear in, in your life. Yeah, well, in 1967, <clears throat> which was the first year our, Senator Baker's time there. Uh, he had a softball team for his staff, and Senator Tower of Texas had one for his staff. They were the only two Republican senators from the South. And during the game, I saw this really good looking girl with red shorts slide into first base. Red shorts, and I, and you I, still I, remember. And I began to, I remember very well, and I began to, uh, I think I hit four home runs after that, and I was acting like a peacock. <laughs> and I chased her for about a year and a half, and we married uh, nearly 50 years ago this next January. Well, uh, what was her name? Her name was 
Leslie Catherine Bueller. She was from Victoria, Texas, but everybody had called her a honey since she was a baby. And so Honey Bueller was her, was and is well, her name. She is, uh, was and is a uh, honey, but what is her real name? Leslie Catherine Okay, you just Bueller. said that. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, we were married on January 4th, 1969 in Victoria, Texas. How many years have you been married now? Well, be 50 in January. <clears throat> wow. Uh, well, that's a good time to uh, mention your wonderful children and grandchildren. Uh, beginning with the oldest child, Drew, why don't you uh, give us the names and ages of your children? Okay, I, I'll give you the. I'll give you when they, when they were born. Andrew Franklin Alexander. Drew was born in in um, 1969 in September, September 21st. Um, uh, Leslie um, Taylor Alexander was born after we had moved back to Nashville in 1972, March 17th. And Catherine Rankin Alexander, that's my mother's family <coughs> name was born in 1974 in June, just as I was campaigning for governor for the first time. And then William Houston Alexander was born in May 14th of 1979, which was the first year I was governor of Tennessee. Now you have some grandchildren. I have nine grandchildren and I have their birth dates here on well, a piece of paper. <laughs> but they, they, we began having grandchildren in 2000. Five, so the oldest, Taylor Irwin, is is uh, thirteen, and the youngest that was Drew's. Is that, that, that that is Leslie's. Oh, Leslie's. That, that's Leslie's, and the okay. youngest is Wynn uh, Sayers Alexander, and she she was born a month ago, but uh, after Taylor came Lauren and Helen, who are Drew Alexander's uh, children, and they were born in two thousand eight and nine. And then um, after that came Jonathan and Matthew Devonso, who are Catherine's two oldest sons. And then Houston Lamar Alexander. Uh, they did him the favor of calling him Houston instead of tagging him with Lamar for the rest of his life. But he's five years old and he was born in 2012. Then his two sisters, Margaret Blair Alexander and Wynn Sayers Alexander. Uh, Margaret was born in um, 2015 and when was born a month ago. Wow, good. Uh, before you left Washington to come back, uh, well, really to Nashville, I guess, uh, you worked for uh, Bryce Harlow. Uh, and uh, he was a, the executive's president, uh, executive assistant to the president, but you, you were not only there, but I think you had uh, also uh, uh, worked for the president. But tell us uh, about that role before you came back to Tennessee. Well, I often say to young people who ask me for advice, when you're in your 20s, when you're young, the best thing you can do is find someone you respect and volunteer to go to work for them and do anything legal they ask you to do and learn what to do and what not to do. And I was really, really lucky to have three wonderful mentors. Judge Wisdom first, a great lawyer before he became a great judge. Howard Baker, who was a very fine lawyer in East Tennessee for 15 years before he became a, a judge. I mean, I mean, the United States Senator. And then Bryce Harlow, who was um, considered to be uh, the, he, he gave a good name to lobbying. They have an award in, in Washington, D.C. for integrity and, and honor in, in representing people before the government, and it's named for him. But I was working in 1968. I'd volunteered for the Nixon campaign, left the Baker staff, worked in Citizens for Nixon in the Willard Hotel in the fall of 1968. Had this fancy title, um, National Director of Planning, but it <laughs> wasn't, that, wasn't that much. But I was working to recruit people and I, there I met Bud Wilkinson, who oh, you wow. and I, you know, yeah. in, our, in our, of people our age, he was the great football coach. He was the Oklahoma football coach, and he was working there too. Oh, and when the campaign was over, I had no job. And 
Bud Wilkerson called Mr. Harlow, who was also from Oklahoma, and recommended me. And I ended up being his assistant. And so there I was, sitting in the west wing of the White House, in the office where the vice president now is, with Mr. Harlow, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and answering calls from members of Congress. And I got a PhD in politics and government for about a year and a half because he was President Nixon's first appointee and in charge of congressional relations. And wow. a wonderful I, I man of great that. integrity. And, and her, well, that's, that's wonderful. So uh, uh, what about uh, the president himself? Were you, uh, did any work for him? You know, oh, I, that, I, worked, I worked about 50 feet away from him. The I Oval was, Office is not far away, but I, I didn't work directly for him because I was young. I mean, I was 29, and Mr. Harlow, though, was one of his principal assistants. I would help prepare him for congressional meetings. I remember um, when I left in 1970, in July, uh, Mr. Harlow took me in to have a meeting with President Nixon, and he asked me where I was going, and I said, I'm going back to Tennessee, and what are you going to do? I'm going to manage the campaign, I guess this was August, yeah, that's, that's for right. Winfield Dunn, who had just been unexpectedly uh, nominated to be the Republican candidate for governor. And Nixon said, I guess I can say that he said, <laughs> he said, oh, Tennessee said, Tennessee and Indiana have the two most nut cuttingest politics in the country. I said, oh, okay, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> I'll be careful. I, I, I'll be careful. That's exactly what I said. And I, I got honey, and uh, off we came to Nashville. So we moved back to Nashville from the White House in uh, August of 1970 to try to help Governor Dunn, or, Gov or ca candidate Dunn. And, and I remember that in that office was your wife, Marsha, who was uh, helping to run that office. Well, I was. I, I, well, I won't go through that. But anyway, uh, I, we both got involved. But at any rate, uh, <laughs> you, you were you came back because the, uh, the Memphis dentist <coughs> had had won the primary right. Republican primary uh, in Memphis, and there were like seven or eight of them at the time. But he won. Have you ever heard of a of a uh, dentist uh, wanting to, or b being able to go to go to Congress or the governorship like uh, like well, he did? Well, actually, there, there was one. The governor of South Carolina named Edwards had been a dentist. I think in Tennessee history, the most recent thing like uh, Winfield's race was is Bill Lee this year, who had no, right no background now. experience in politics, but uh, was very um, uh, people liked liked him, and uh, he he was running against established political figures and beat them. Reason I came back were really two reasons. One, Mr. Harlow said, "If you're ever going to go home, you better go now." He said, "When I was younger, I kept getting different jobs and asked to stay here for General Marshall, then President Eisenhower, then President Nixon, then Procter and Gamble, and I never got back to Oklahoma." He said, "If you want to go, you better go now." I always wondered if he also had some premonition of that Watergate was not far away and wanted, didn't want me to be tarred by that. And then the other reason was Harry Welford from Memphis had been Winfield Dunn's campaign manager. They didn't have a big group and, down no, there. No, it was a it small was group. Some good, good people. And his that. law firm had said to him, Harry, you've got a job here at the law firm in Memphis and you can't be full time in the general election, so you need to get somebody else. Harry later became the federal district judge and the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals judge, but he called me in August and said, we've won the primary, will you come back? And that wow. plus Mr. Harlow's <clears throat> advice and the fact that I wanted to come home at some point brought me back to Nashville in 1970 with, uh, with Honey and a one-year-old uh, baby. Well, that was a, uh, a good move for uh Winfield Dunn that we that uh, is is still doing well, but uh, the, how did you start off to uh, get him uh, organized? <laughs> <laughs> well, you remember it as well as I do. He 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 wasn't organized. I mean, the the, the campaign was in uh, 
Sanders. <laughs> well, he well, was he, un, he won to... unexpectedly. He got ninety percent of his votes from Memphis. He had great support. He's a fantastic candidate. But throughout the rest of the state, he had he got about the f fourth choice of leadership in every county. He had no money. He had no debt. He had no um, campaign manager at that time because Harry couldn't do it anymore. He had no advertising agency. And this was mid-August <laughs> when he had some enthusiastic volunteers. And I remember going to Memphis. Uh, I got some people to come from Washington with me, Lee Smith, Ralph Griffith, a couple of others, to work with people like you and Marcia and others here. We set up an office here. And what I had to do was just not take any calls for the first two or three weeks to try to organize a campaign, hire an agency, raise some money. And uh, I had to drive to Memphis every Sunday to reassure the Memphis crowd that we, it was okay to move the campaign headquarters to Nashville. And I said to them, which was a mistake, I said, you know, there are a lot of people in East Tennessee who think Memphis is in Arkansas. <laughs> and I should never have said that. <laughs> <laughs> took me a month to but get it's, it's, to recover it's true. from that, that was with, in the, Memphis with these for a people. Long time. So we moved the campaign <laughs> headquarters here. Winfield Dunn was a spectacular candidate. During that, I was having weekly meetings with Bill Willis, who was John J. Hooker's was the Democratic nominee, and Bill Willis, the lawyer from Nashville and law partner, was his manager. And Willis and I would meet every Monday to talk about the debates that we might have. And we became good friends all the way until Bill's death not long ago. And we arranged the debates. And of course, neither of us were modest, so both of us thought we would make better governors than either John Jay or Winfield. <laughs> but we were the only ones who thought that. But uh, it created uh, one of, politics then was, you know, rough and tumble and partisan, and the Tennessean and the banner were just knocking the heck out of each other. But it was fun. I mean, it was purposeful because we were trying to build a two-party system on our side, and it was fun because some of the best people in the state were involved in it and trying to make the state better on the other side as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, <clears throat> well, we take a short break and uh, come back and try to get through you. Okay. Lamar, you, we were talking about uh, you, you've got your campaign organized and you've got some key people you'd mentioned that you knew and they were going to, doing a good job for you. Kind of how did, uh, how did the campaign go and uh, who won? Winfield Dunn beat John J. Hooker, Jr. It was a, it was a wild campaign. It was, uh, Dunn ran a campaign to save the state from John J. Hooker and John J., who was a great friend, uh, was a, when we arrived in Nashville in 1970, every conversation, every social conversation in Nashville was about John J. Hooker Jr., whether he was there or not. Uh, I never knew anyone who so dominated, dominated uh, conversation in an area or, 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 or place. And later when he had his 50th birthday and I was the governor, we had a birthday party for him at the governor's residence and he had every big celebrity in the world there. Muhammad Ali, Howard Cosell, uh, Andy Williams, <laughs> Gene Autry. <laughs> so that was the size of the personality in the campaign. And we, Bill Willis and I uh, cooked up three debates, uh, one at Rolling Mill Hill, a garbage dump here in Nashville, one in Clarksville, and one in Jackson all on one day where Hooker was trying to show that Dunn knew nothing about the government and Dunn was trying to show that Hooker was too dangerous for the state. And Dunn did fine and he won and it was November of 1970. And I had, you know, I'd, I'd gone to New York University Law School in order to get away from Tennessee because obviously I had a political pull inside of me for some reason and I wanted to get away from that. And I also wanted to get away from Tennessee to try to make sure that I really wanted to live here for the rest of my life. So after having done that and living in Washington and Los Angeles and New Orleans, I knew I wanted to live here for the rest of my life. So that's what brought us back here. And I also thought it was time to get out of government. So after the campaign was over, Winfield asked me to be head of his transition because I didn't want a job in the administration. 
and because there was nobody else to do it. I mean, it had been 50 years since there had been a Republican governor, right. so there was nobody around who, who knew anything about it. So I did that until January. And then um, uh, I, Bill Dearborn and Bob Warner, um, who were practicing law here in Nashville, Bill went to Harvard, Bob went to Yale. They had a small practice. They worked with Commerce Union Bank. They invited me to be a part of their firm, and they generously called it Dearborn, Warner, and Alexander. So I began practicing law in Nashville in 1971 uh, with, with them. Our clients were uh, varied. Uh, our, most, our steadiest client was Commerce Union Bank, so I did a lot of bank work. But I began to get introduced to other cases. We're in the office of Neil and Harwell here. Um, there was the great case of Booger's Fireworks, which was up around Clarksville, and I think Aubrey and I went up to do that. He knew what he was doing. I didn't so much. I did Will case with John Roberts over in Livingston. I did a labor case in, with Don Stansberry in, in, um, in Scott County. Um, one of the things that happened was that was the time of the wage and price controls put in by Nixon and John Connolly. And it created a huge bureaucracy in Washington, but you could get exemptions from it. And so suddenly there was a line of people, clients outside my door a mile long, not because I was a great lawyer, but they thought I knew somebody in yeah. Washington <laughs> helped them get an exemption. That didn't last very long. I represented a group of parents who were concerned about desegregation of schools in Nashville. That was the time of Judge Morton's desegregation order. Most interesting case I guess I dealt with was uh, Hooper versus the Tennessean. I'd mentioned Bill Willis earlier, who was the Tennessean's lawyer and John Sigenthaler's buddy, the publisher of the Tennessean. And uh, James Hooper of Mississippi had been nominated by President Ford for the TVA board. And the Tennessean, through its reporter Nat Caldwell, had written that he was a huckster and a hustler. And Hooper didn't like that, and he sued the Tennessean. And Eamon Carter Evans, the owner of the Tennesseans, was worried because that might mean dollars out of his pocket. So they associated me with the case. I'm sure it had nothing to do with the fact there was a Republican federal district judge at the time, and they were all Democrats. <laughs> but anyway, they did. And we, we went to Mississippi for depositions in 1977 and had a great time uh, working the case. And then in 1978, when I was walking across Tennessee in my red and black shirt to be uh, governor, I got off the trail and had the hearing before Judge Morton about Hooper versus the Tennessee. And the Tennessee and won the case. Good. Um, so you were with them uh, for what, a couple of years? And well, a couple of years. And then, then, um, then some young people, young lawyers, namely Robert Eccles, um, Lou Connor, Martin Simmons, and I, we all thought we would like to have our own firm. But we knew we were young lawyers and we didn't know that many people. So we decided we would ask the two most respected senior lawyers in our respective firms, which were Bill Dearborn and Andrew Ewing in your firm, to, to be uh, to head a firm. And we thought we'd get a little bit ahead of the game because rather than having, used to be law firms were named after everybody in the firm so that so the receptionist would pick up the phone and say, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, you know, all the way through. And now law firms were getting shorter. So we thought we would be stylish and we called our law firm Dearborn and Ewing. And it included you and me and Lou Connor and, and um, Martin Simmons, all close friends, as well as a number of others. That was a very good law firm. And I worked there until I ran for governor in 19, I ran in 74 was nominated, lost to Ray Blanton, and then I ran again in 78. So you could tell by that I had some very understanding law partners who allowed me to do that during that time. But I was with Dearborn and Ewing from about 72, I guess it yeah. was, when we started that until I, I, became, right. I became governor in January yeah. of 79. Did you enjoy the uh, law practice? I did, but, but you know. You know I, that's what I'm the, wondering, the, the because truth, you've had all this other experience. Yeah. And, uh, I, 
I, so anyway. I, I was trying to be governor of the state at, at age 33 and then at age 37, and I was preoccupied with that. So that kept me from being really a great, good lawyer. I mean, I, I, well, you I, I might have been if I'd really worked on it for a while. But, uh, but the truth is that I had to rely on other lawyers to, 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 to do my work well. And I enjoyed more the prospect of being governor of Tennessee than I did law practice in the 1970s. Well, good. So uh, you started on that uh, that different, I guess, well, I guess that path, and and uh, left the law practice uh, at Dearborn and Ewing. What was your What was that next step? Well, I was governor in 1979. I mean, but, but when you decided to make that uh, that change, how did that come about? Well, it came about in in first. I ran in 1974. Uh, governor Dunn had been could not succeed himself. That's right. There weren't, I mean, we were a young statewide party at the time. And so I ran in 74 and, and um, Nat Winston and Dorch from, uh, Dorch Oldham also ran in the Republican primary. Uh, there were seven or eight Democrats who ran. There were more candidates for governor than there were candidates for sheriff of Union <laughs> County, which was very unusual. Um, and I upset Oldham and Winston. I got about half the vote. They were, they were much better known than I. But I lost the general election, uh, partly because I wasn't such a good candidate, maybe, um, and was new. Uh, but a lot of it was Watergate. That was the year that the voters punished the Republican Party over Watergate, and we lost tax assessors. Um, Tennessean wrote after I lost in 1974 that there wouldn't be a Republican governor for 50 years. So I went back to Dearborn and Ewing. I figured my political career was over and I began to think about what else to do. Um, I, I tried to make some extra money. I bought and sold houses. Uh, they didn't make much money. Uh, one house I bought, the owner had had a horse in the bathroom and I had to clean it up. And, and made, made a profit. So I got over that. I got involved with Ruby Tuesday restaurants with my friend Sandy Bell. Owned about 10% of that during that time. So I began to get into business activities. And then Sandy and I uh, bought Blackberry Farm in 1976 for about $110,000, all of which we borrowed wow. with the goal of, with the goal of, uh, of, um, protecting the land around it, having a cabin for ourselves. And then Sandy and his wife, Chris, wanted to build what they called a nice inn. Well, by about 1993, the inn was so nice, I said, I don't have any business being involved in this. And so we split it up and I took property next to it. And Blackberry Farm has become one of the nicest resorts anywhere in the world, according to people who rank such things. So I got pretty involved with business in, in the mid-1970s as well as the Dearborn and Ewing law practice. The, uh, when you next ran, uh, did you find that your uh, work in Washington uh, hurt, your, hurt your position? Well, it did in 1974. I mean, uh, Ray Blanton called me Richard Nixon's choir boy. And I said, well, maybe we need a few more choir boys after seeing how he conducted himself. But no, by 78, I don't think being in Washington hurt. That was far enough away from, from uh, Watergate. What I did in 1978 was uh, when I told Honey, my wife, I wanted to run again. Well, there's a, there's a preliminary to that. In 1977, I was back practicing law, just bought Blackberry Farm, trying to make money not really very satisfied with what I was doing, and Howard Baker called me. He'd just been elected Republican leader of the Senate, and he asked me to come help him for a few months to set up his office. Honey encouraged me to go. He called on our wedding anniversary on January the 4th, 1977. And uh, so I did, and I stayed three or four months, and I got reinvigorated there. Jimmy Carter had been elected. I met Doug Bailey, who who agreed if I decided to run for governor again to help be my campaign consultant. And I came back in 1977 and thought about running for governor. And that led me to a discussion with my wife and Tom Ingram and Doug Bailey 
And Honey said, well, if you run like you did before, you lose. You just went around the state in a blue suit talking to Kiwanis clubs, and uh, why don't you do something else? And out of that came the idea of a walk across Tennessee. Uh, she said, do something you like to do. I like the outdoors. I like meeting people. I like not going to you know, political meetings. So I walked across the state. I tried to shake a thousand hands a day. I started on January 26th in Maribel. It was really cold. Walked to Mountain City. That's the wrong way if you're following the map. <laughs> I got there March the 1st, three feet of snow, turned around and said, I'm supposed to go to Memphis from here. <laughs> Whose idea was this? I got to Memphis July the 6th. I did shake about a thousand hands a day. Um, and I'm sure it made me a much better governor and, and put me in much better touch with Tennessee. And even today, 40 years later, I can remember families that I've stayed with. I can remember their names um, without taking very long. I can just give you one little story. I stayed in Milton in Rutherford County with the Knight family in about May it must have been. He was the postmaster. This is just outside Murfreesboro. She was the secretary at Las Casas School. She told me that night, she said, I'm very sad. She said, I have twin boys who are smart. They'll never get a job around here. There are no good jobs. And I'll never see my grandchildren. Last year, one of those twins, Randy Knight, retired. He had been the CEO of Nissan's plant here in Rutherford County. Wow. His brother works there. The grandson she thought she'd never see works there. And so I'm able to see over that 40 years from that walk till today the impact of Nissan coming to hear, and because I spent the night with people, I could get a sense of, of how that really affects people Who set personally. up your stops, and uh, did, did you have any checks on the people with whom you stayed? Akeel Hunt, Louis Levine, Tom Ingram were the main ones who did that. It was very carefully organized. We tried to pick the right people to stay with every county, like in Milton. We didn't stay with the big shot. We stayed with with the postmaster and the school secretary, and in Murray County with the Farm Bureau president, and, and with the church singing group in Church Hill, Tennessee. And so I would put an X down every day with a piece of chalk when I finished my walk, and then I'd go off and go to ball games, or they'd have people over for supper, or I'd, we'd spend the night. I'd get up in the morning, go visit a plant, go back to the X and start walking you know, 10 miles, and people would come by and try to give me a ride to see if I was really walking. <laughs> and I never took the ride, so I walked the whole, the whole way. And that was uh, a thou over a thousand miles? It was over a thousand miles, yeah. yeah. And that helped me in the general election win a very tough race. This, this was when Tennessee politics had, was moving from a one-party Democratic state to a competitive state. Yeah. So Jake Butcher, was the Democratic nominee in 1978. He was a very strong candidate, spent a lot of money, uh, but uh, I, I won with about 44, 54% of the vote. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, right after, well, not right after it, but in early uh, 1979, uh, that's when Governor Blanton uh, was in uh, in the governor's seat, and they had uh, this investigation for cash for clemency scandal. And uh, well, Governor Blanton had been in for the four years previously, <clears throat> and right. and yeah. the FBI and others had investigated that. And after I was elected in November of 1978, there became a cry. Uh, governor Blanton was pardoning people and commuting people. And there was an FBI investigation into whether he was, someone was taking cash for those pardons. And there was one especially notorious pardon that Governor Dunn and John J. Hooker teamed up to get a million signatures to try to persuade Blanton not to do. And, and, and so that was all going on. And the long and short of it was that by the time we got to January, <clears throat> on January, uh, on the week of my swearing in as governor, I was to be sworn in on a Saturday. 
On Monday night, Governor Blanton went to the state capitol and he signed 52 commutations and pardons uh, of murderers, very, very dangerous people. And the Secretary of the State who has to sign all of those was there with him. And the governor said to the Secretary of State, this takes guts. And the Secretary of State said to the governor, some people have more guts than brains. <laughs> and the next morning there was this huge explosion and there was this talk of swearing me in early. And, and I, of course, didn't want to do that because that, to me, violated all the norms of the law in the United States. I didn't see how that could happen. And then Hal Hardin, the next day, the U.S. attorney, a young Democrat lawyer from Nashville, whom I respected but didn't know, called me at noon on Wednesday and said, Lamar, uh, I'm calling to ask you to be sworn in early to prevent Governor Blanton from releasing uh, prisoners whom the FBI has evidence have paid cash for their release. And I said, Hal, why don't I call you back in 10 minutes and see if you can say the same thing? Because I didn't know if it was him or, and I wanted to think. So I called him back at the U.S. Attorney's Office. He said the same thing and at 5.50 that afternoon, the Democratic leader of the ship of the state, after Bill Leach, the Attorney General, gave an opinion that it was constitutional, swore me in as governor three days early. So that was January 17, 1979. That was uh, a scary time uh, for you, uh, but for, uh, for a lot of people. I'm, uh, I've heard about all these things. I, uh, was in law school with Eddie Sisk, and uh, he was involved in some of that. Anyway, well, let's talk about, uh, I mean, after running uh, against the, uh, the Knoxville uh, mayor, Randy Tyree, what, uh, when was that, Lamar? Well, I served four years from 1979 to 1983, and then I ran for re in 1980 uh, in 1982 and uh, Randy Tyree, the Knoxville mayor, was my opponent and I won that race. Uh, in 84, uh, there was an open seat uh, of majority leader, Howard Baker. Uh, you were not able to uh, be involved in that, is that right? Well, I, I, I could have been, but I didn't really want to be. Uh, President Reagan was here in 1984 and uh, flying over to Knoxville where he appeared at Farragut High School, he, he asked me to run for Howard Baker's Senate seat. And I said that I wanted to finish my job as governor. And then I said, Mr. President, I noticed you never ran for the United States Senate. And he just smiled. I had a I felt a great mission as governor. It sounds a little corny to say, but Alex Haley one time told me that when he wrote Roots, he had all this research piled up, and then one night while he was on a ship in the ocean, it just all came to him what the story should be, and it was like a stream rushing, and he wrote the book all the way through to the end. I felt that way as governor. I felt like that I'd become governor at a time when we were the third poorest state based on family income, when the world was changing, when the parties were becoming a competitive system, and there was a lot to do, a lot of opportunity for the state. And by the time I got to my second term, you know, Nissan had come, we were recruiting Saturn, we were becoming the first state to pay teachers more for teaching well, building the best road system in the country to attract uh, the auto suppliers, of which we now have a thousand in Tennessee. So I didn't want to give that up in 1984 and campaign for two years and then leave for two years. So I didn't run. Well, I, uh, when I was talking with, uh, with one of my friends and said that you were going to be interviewed and so forth, uh, one of the comments that was made was that uh, Alexander's biggest accomplishment as governor was the relationship you that you cultivated with the Japanese corporate community, which resulted in the construction of a 500 million Nissan plant in Smyrna, Tennessee in 1982. Would, uh, what do you say about that? That's, that? that's probably true looking back. That 
You know, no one said to me when I walked across the state 40 years ago, Lamar, why don't you go to Japan when you get elected? <laughs> I mean, I didn't, never thought about it. But President Carter said to me, right after I was elected, and to the other governors, governors, go to Japan, persuade them to make in the United States what they sell here. And just at that time, the Japanese were moving from manufacturing everything there, Sony, Nissan, Toyota, to manufacturing it here. So I went in the fall of 1979, met with the Nissan people, and they came. Every state in the eastern United States wanted them, and it, it, it created a lot of interest in Tennessee. They, they basically took a look at what you needed to do to build a successful plant, and, and they wanted to get out of the Midwest with its labor environment, but still wanted to be in a central location. And the reason they came, I'm confident, was because we were the, every state north of us did not have a right to work law. Plus we worked hard at making them feel comfortable here. And that began the process of Saturn and then later Volkswagen. Did, but, you, go, did you go over there? I went there in the November of 1979 and I went back did. about seven or eight times over the yeah. eight years I was there. By the mid 1980s, the ambassador uh, of Japan to the United States, uh, Okawara, said that Tennessee had about 50% of all the Japanese capital investment in the United States. And that was important, but what was more important was bringing the auto industry as a result of that arrival. The, uh, did you, uh, during this time, uh, were you enjoying your governorship? I mean, Governor being that oh, oh, a lot of responsibility after you. Uh, yeah, in the, in the same way that I mentioned Alex Haley writing, feeling like, I mean, I got up every day thinking that, that I had a chance to help our state realize its potential, whether it, I want us to be first in some things. You know, I want us to have the best road system. I want us to have, be the first to pay teachers more for teaching well. I want us to win the Nissan competition, win the Saturn competition. And, and then finally we had what we called Tennessee Homecoming 86 and that year, and that was a celebration in what turned out to be hundreds of communities of what made those communities specials. And I think it helped elevate uh, the attitudes in our state. We, we had a little bit of feeling in this state that somehow we were not as good as other places. I think some of it's left over from the Civil War some from being in the Appalachian mountain tag. But pretty soon we began to show, yeah, we can do this stuff. We can do it better than you can. So we celebrated our music and our manufacturing and the things we could do better than anybody else. And I love doing it and I love being governor. Well, was, is uh, the most difficult, what was the most difficult part of your job as the governor? I mean, you sound, I mean, it sound like the captain of the team, which well, maybe the governor is. Well, he's captain. The job of the governor I got from a book that George Reedy wrote, who was Lyndon Johnson's press secretary, about the job of the president, and is one, to see an urgent need, two, to develop a strategy to meet that need, and three, to persuade at least half the people you're right. So that's the way I saw the job. So I got Louis Donaldson from Memphis, a great lawyer. He was about 60, probably the leading lawyer in the state in some ways to come in and be the chief operating officer of state government. And Louis like, used to tell this story. He died last year at age 100. He said, Lama would say, Louis, you run the state and I'll be the governor. And that's the way it worked. <laughs> so he ran the operations. Tom Ingram was the chief of staff and that left me free to see an urgent need, bring in the auto industry, uh, develop a strategy to meet the need, three road programs, and persuade at least half the people you're right, vote for a gas tax three times. <laughs> so that's how I saw the job of governor. Well, uh, when did you decide uh, to go to Australia? Well, my wife decided <laughs> that we were sitting around the table in the governor's residence in 1985 or 6, and Honey said, we have to get out of here. We had the children there. The children had gradually turned their chairs over the years toward their mother's end of the table and away from mine, because when I was at dinner, I'd be thinking about all this other stuff. And uh, 
we began to think about where, and we thought we want to go a long way away where nobody can find us and, and sort of be ourselves and, and place will be fun. So we picked Australia for that reason. It, the weather would be good because their months are reverse of ours. They speak English. It's so far away that we, if, at that time, of course, there's no internet. The fax wasn't even much in use. It took two weeks to get a letter there. So if somebody were to criticize my administration, I wouldn't <laughs> even know about it. And then Howard Baker did call after about a month. President Reagan got him to be his chief of staff at the White House. He wanted me to come back and join him. And I said, Howard, I can't do it. I'm too far away. <laughs> So it, it, it gave me complete separation and a chance for the family to be together. And uh, after I came back, I wrote a book called Six Months Off, which William Morrow published and um, Dick Estelle read in its entirety on National Public Radio in 1988. The, uh, when you got back, uh, I read in the paper that uh, you were going to be the president of UT. Was that the time? The university? Well, when I came back in 1987, what I, I went to Belmont University for a year. They invited me to be sort of an adjunct professor, and I wrote my book, Six Months Off, and I did some other things there. And during that year, the University of Tennessee Board of Trustees asked me to be the president of the university and so I became the president of the university in, in system in the middle of 1988. And after that you moved on to what was the next job after you left? Well I was there president. three years. I three was there years. three years and in 1990 in December President H.W. Bush called me and he wanted me to be the U.S. Education Secretary. And uh, so I was, from 1991 to 1993, I was the U.S. Education Secretary in George H.W. Bush's that, cabinet. Were you headquartered in, in uh, D.C.? Yes, yes. At that time? Yeah, I'd, we had moved to Knoxville. We just moved to Knoxville. I was only at UT about three years. And, uh, and we moved immediately to probably a little prematurely because it took longer for me to be confirmed than I'd expected, but I sold my house in, in Knoxville um, and, and um, uh, got a house in Washington. Uh, Catherine went to school at, she was going to school at Bearden. She moved with us to Washington. Will was going to school at Webb. He moved with us to Washington. So it was an abrupt change for the family. I overlooked the fact, if I could go back a, just sure, a year, that sure. in that time after I was governor, <clears throat> um, I, f I helped form a business. Uh, Brad Martin called me as I was l from Memphis, called me as I was leaving office in uh, 86 and said, I have Captain Kangaroo here. Why don't we start a child care company? And I said, well, I have to do something. Uh, we were planning to go to Australia then. This is just before we left. I said, but we need to get somebody who knows something about child care other than Captain Kangaroo. And he said, who would you suggest? And I said, well, honey, my wife, and Marguerite Salee, who had, was in my cabinet and who headed our Healthy Children Initiative. Well, the long and short was the five of us founded a company called Corporate Child Care Incorporated, which provided work site daycare. That's to help moms take their babies to work, basically, uh, which was getting to be more of an issue in families as two people worked outside the home. Marguerite really did the work on it. She was the CEO. Ten years later, it went public, NASDAQ. And there was another company right beside it called Bright Horizons that formed the same year. And Mitt Romney's company backed that. We, they tried to go public, couldn't. We did and could. They did, and then we merged the companies, and now Bright Horizons is the largest provider of worksite daycare in the world. So that, that and Blackberry Farm are probably the two business ventures that I helped to co-found that were most successful. Are you still involved, or have you sold your interest? Sold the interest in 2008. Uh, is there... Uh, 
is there uh, any any difference? Oh, not difference. There's is there any uh, similarity between uh, being university a university president as you have and being governor? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, answer, the short answer is the, no. <laughs> the university. <laughs> short answer. There is some being in the Senate. Senator Kenneth D. McKellar, who served six terms from Tennessee, used to say that the United States Senate is like the faculty of a great university. And there's something to that where, where you pretty well have a position. It's not tenured. You have to run every six years. But you can pretty well do what you want to. And that's what good professors do in their universities. But uh, a governor's job, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of like Moses, you know. Here's a need, here's a plan, I want to persuade you I'm right. Uh, in the first month I was at the University of Tennessee, a faculty group came to see me and said, uh, we'd like to talk to you. I said, well, good, nice to see you. He said, uh, we, we think there's something you might not know. He said, here, we think the, the process is more important than the result, and we thought you might not be aware of that. And I said, well, I really wasn't <laughs> because I spent my whole life working on results. So I didn't. Was that true? Oh, it is true at a university. Uh, and you have to have a special temperament to be uh, the leader of a university. You have to show great respect, great patience for the process, and you can still engineer results. More like the United States Senate, but it's not like being governor. I, I did my best work at the University of Tennessee when I was governor because I was chairman of the board and I had the budget. And I, well, could, and I could influence the university uh, much more that way than when I was the president of the system. And you had good football seats. Well, I, I got those after I was president, but I pay for them with my own money, well, let me say that. Well, I that you got them free, but, <laughs> but I know that you had a good seat at the football games. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the next one was the being the Secretary of Education. When, uh, in 1991 to 1993, after you became president of UT, uh, being the Secretary of Education, you, I think you mentioned that, but uh, what, were your, what were your duties there? Well, my duties were, you know, 90% of funding for elementary and secondary education is from state and local funds. So it's more of a bully pulpit than a manager of education. But the first thing I did, since we're, this is a legal interview, was to get a good lawyer. Uh, Brad Martin from Memphis had a brother named, has a brother named Jeff Martin, who was a fine lawyer in Washington, D.C., who had never done any public service. And I was able to get him to become general counsel of the Department of Education. And Harry Truman said, you need a dog in Washington? I think what you need is a good lawyer. And so Jeff kept me out of trouble and did a terrific job with a number of very complex issues that come before you, such as affirmative action questions and, and uh, Title IX questions. So getting a good lawyer was part of it. But basically what I tried to do was to help President Bush encourage community by community higher standards, uh, more choices of schools, uh, better pay for teachers, but I did not want to do that with orders from Washington, D.C. That was, that's the fight I've had to fight for 40 years uh, as governor, education secretary, and now senator, is people get good ideas, and they go to Washington, and they say, okay, here's a good idea, school uniforms. Let's have all 100,000 public schools wear the same school uniforms. Well, it might be a good idea in many of the schools, but it's not up to senators and congressmen to make that decision, is my view. So that was really what I did in the two years when I were there. We called it America 2000. We had almost every state involved on a bipartisan basis to try to move their community and their state toward the national education goals, higher standards, more choices, and more start from scratch schools, which later became known as charter schools. Uh, Tell us about your, uh, your well, I'm, I'm sure somebody asked you to uh, run for the open seat when uh, Fred Thompson decided to retire. 
uh, well, actually, actually they didn't. That was that was oh, 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 when he retired. When when in, in two thousand two. No, no, you're right. Actually, they did. Now I was thinking about when Fred Thompson. Run. I I asked Fred Thompson to run when he ran in nineteen ninety four. Uh, we ought to take just a minute on Fred Thompson. Fred was one of the few Republican lawyers in Nashville when I moved back here in 1970. And um, I introduced him to Howard Baker and he became Baker's um, um, uh, uh, Middle Tennessee campaign manager. And then when Baker was appointed head of the Watergate minority side of the committee in 1973, he asked me to be the counsel. And I just moved back here and just gotten settled. I said, I can't do that. I don't want to, I don't have that kind of training and I don't really want to investigate people for whom I used to, with whom I used to work. And I want to be in Tennessee. Why don't you ask Fred? And he did ask Fred and that gave Fred his national stage on which he was very, very good. And he asked the question about, uh, of Alexander Butterfield about the Watergate tapes. I'd always thought Fred would be a great public official. And so when H.W. Bush was ending his term in 92, I asked Fred to run for the Senate in 94. And I remember taking him to lunch at the White House and his whole conversation was not about the politics. It was about what do you think I could accomplish? The kind of conversation you would hope a United States Senator would have. And he did run in 94 and his personality was so large <laughs> that as soon as he appeared on television, he won overwhelmingly and he won again. And then, in response to your question, we got to 2002. What had happened was in the 90s, I had run for president and then tried again and then served at, uh, I'd been on the faculty at Harvard for two years and Fred decided to retire. And uh, it was the spring of 2002. And uh, Bill Frisk came by to see me with a poll that showed I could win. And, and I decided to, to, to run for the Senate. And I won the primary and won the general election in 2002. Uh, well, that cleared, uh, cleared some of that up because I had not uh, talked in the past uh, about, of course, Fred's not here anymore, but about all that, how that, came about. Uh, but uh, that um, you skipped the 90s. <laughs> well good. Maybe, you might go back need, to that. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to talk about running for president now. <laughs> well I think I think the way to deal with that is that in, in when I left uh, uh, in 1990 um, Three in January, uh, the voters ushered H.W. Bush out of office and me with him. And so uh, Honey and I drove back to Nashville. And uh, Howard Baker had recruited, had formed a, a, a law firm called Baker Donaldson. And he recruited uh, Larry Eagleburger, who was the United States Secretary of State, and me to join that firm. So I was with the Baker Donaldson firm from 1993 until 2001. And uh, again, I had generous law partners because they allowed me to pursue my political interests. I, I spent a lot of time in 94 and 5 and early 96 uh, seeking the Republican nominee for president. I did pretty well given the level of competition, did well in Iowa and New Hampshire, and, but not well enough to continue. And uh, then I tried again in 1999. Um, that was reminiscent of the Wright Brothers airplane. It took off about this far and <laughs> came back to the ground. And I, I was out of that by August of 1999. So I was back practicing law without, uh, without that much to do. And, um, and uh, the dean of the Kennedy School of Government called me and asked me to be an adjunct professor at the School of Government. And so that's what I did from 2000 to 2002. And teaching a course in the American character and teaching a course in what I call the ultimate startup uh, running for president. Well, I lost that part of your, uh, 
life, I guess. I mean, I knew you weren't around, but I didn't follow that closely and didn't have it. Why don't we take a short break? Okay. Lamar, tell me uh, more about what it's like to run for president. Uh, I mentioned that uh, when I was invited to go to Harvard School of Government and teach a course, uh, they wanted me to teach about that. And so I called it the ultimate startup. And I think that's really what it is. I mean, imagine yourself sitting wherever you are in Nashville, Maryville, saying, I'm going to run for president of the United States. Uh, nobody really knows who you are. Uh, you've got to raise a lot of money. You've got to take whatever your purpose in doing that is and get it in front of a lot of people in a country of 330 million plus people. It's just how do, you, how do you do that? And you do it at a time when you have other people, particularly today, who've gotten famous really for being famous. They're on television. So they're instantly known to everybody in the country and you're not known at all. So you have to figure out how do I, how does one do, how does one do that? Uh, to give you an idea of the challenge of it, um, in 1995, after I had been to Iowa 80 times, which is where the Iowa caucus is, and honey, my wife had been to 80 different cities in Iowa, and it was in a year when I was going to more than 200 fundraisers around the country to raise money at $1,000 a person because that was the limits then. Uh, and I had already been governor and United States education secretary. So I did a poll to see how I was doing in Iowa. And Whit Ayers, who was my pollster, came back and we called a little staff meeting. He said, Governor, this is the professional challenge of my career. Now, this is about six months before the Iowa caucus. It says it's Dole, 54%, Bob Dole, Alexander, 3%, margin of error, 4%. <laughs> so I said, I thought for a minute, I said, well, now, Whit, uh, what does someone do in a circumstance like this? So, so I just said, oh, we'll just go ahead. And, uh, uh, here's what happened. Uh, Phil Graham, Senator Phil Graham, went to Louisiana and took the press with him so they could watch him win the Louisiana caucus, and Pat Buchanan beat him. Uh, a whole series of people who said they might run, Colin Powell, Dick Cheney, Bill Bennett, Governor Carol Campbell, Jack Kemp, didn't run. Steve Forbes decided he would run. He'd never been a candidate for sheriff even, but he had a lot of money and he came in and spent $40 million of his money in about three months attacking Bob Dole in Iowa. So Bob Dole spent money attacking Steve Forbes in Iowa. So I said, well, you know, might be true about both of them, vote for me. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Graham was out, Dole was down, Forbes was up a little bit, and on Iowa caucus day, six months after that poll, it was Dole 24, uh, Buchanan 21, Alexander 18, and I was going up. And the editor of Time Magazine, Walter Isaacson, kicked his reporter off the airplane that was flying to New Hampshire that night. It was a young reporter named John Dickerson who was covering me because uh, he was the youngest reporter and I was the furthest behind candidate. And so Walter Isaacson flew with me and I was on the cover of Time Magazine that week. And eight oh. days later, I nearly won the New Hampshire primary. Uh, I can still remember the night when Dan Rather, it was eight o'clock and he said, Governor, this is the profession. You no, know, he said, Governor, uh, we call this hot lead in Texas. It's our, it, the early returns say Dole 27, um, uh, no, Buchanan 27, Pat Buchanan. Dole, no, Dole 27, Buchanan 26, Alexander 24. How do you feel? And I said, I feel great, but I didn't feel good because the rule of thumb is that the top two in New Hampshire are the ones who go on. And if, and if either Buchanan or I had beaten Dole, uh, he would have dropped out at that point. And I had been ahead in New Hampshire three or four days before. So I spent about two or three years on it. 
uh, I made all those trips that I told you about. I got pretty far, but not far, not far enough. And then I thought, well, I did well, so I'll try again. And I tried in 99, but George W. Bush had such a head of steam that by the time of the Iowa um, straw poll in August of 1999, I think I came in fifth in that, and I decided this isn't gonna work. So, so I dropped out. And so I retired permanently from politics for the second time in my, in my life. But it, it was an exciting time, but it, it's, uh, it's not as easy as it, as it looks. The, uh, the question uh, that had been asked, is there, uh, is there and describe uh, the difference between a Senate campaign and a governor's campaign? Not that much. The issues are different once you get in. The job is extremely different. I mean, uh, but, but the fundamental difference is the Senate campaign is more ideological and the governor's race is more about someone who, in whom you have confidence to lead your state. I mean, a, a lot of people will vote for a candidate for governor because they have confidence in his or her ability to you know, recruit an industry, build a road, make that kind of decision. When you're voting for a candidate for the Senate, it's more important to many voters if you're liberal or if you're conservative, if you're on this position on immigration or that, if you're for lower taxes or for more spending. So a Senate race is more ideological than a governor's race. So you ran for Senate in 2002? Yes. I ran in 2002. Um, I had the great advantage of having a short campaign these days in order to run for governor or senate in Tennessee, you have to run for a couple of years. Uh, I mean, Bill Haslam, Bill Lee, Phil Bredesen, candidates running these days have to run for that long a time. But Fred Thompson decided in the spring of, night of 2002 that he would not run. So I had three months, or four really, before the primary in, in August, and I was still on the faculty at Harvard. So I finished the course and graded the papers and come home, came home and ran for two months and still won the primary against a very well-respected congressman, Ed Bright. And then I um, won the general election against Congressman Bob Clement. That was the same year that Phil Bredesen was elected governor. So if you're looking at Tennessee history, the political part, at that stage, we were still a very evenly divided state. A Democrat could win a statewide race, as Governor Bredesen did that year, and a Republican could win the Senate race, as I did that year, on the same ballot. Now, since then, we've become more of a one-party Republican state, just the reverse of what it was when I started with Howard Baker in the 1960s, and we were a one-party Democratic state. But in 2002, when I was elected to the Senate, we were pretty evenly split. And the same was true still in 2006 when Bob Corker and Harold Ford had the closest Senate race in Tennessee history and Bob barely won that. Ford ran a good campaign and, and, and we were evenly divided. Since then, it's kind of gone straight toward the Republican side. Um, what is the difference in your view of the legislative work that you do and the executive work that you do? Well, I mentioned earlier the, the job of the executive is, is, is see the urgent need, is, is sort of the Moses role. Let's go this way. And then the legislators are kind of like the cows out around in the field chewing their cud waiting for somebody to suggest something. And then they'll all go that way or not. So the executive role is the leadership role. The legislative role is more of a reactive representative role. So that's the basic difference. Now, being a former governor, I always keep trying as a senator to provide some leadership. Let's, let's do the opioids bill this way. Let's do the songwriters bill this way. Let's, let's uh, be first in the world in supercomputing, so let's appropriate dollars here. So I, uh, many governors are miserable in the United States Senate. They're accustomed to the leadership role and not to the legislative role. Many legislators are miserable governors 
because they see they're used to an ideological role as in the United States Senate. I'm for immigration. I'm against immigration. I'm for taxes. I'm against it. And then they come to the governorship and they find that's not the job. The job is to see a need, develop a plan, persuade half the people you're right, work across the aisle, move people along. And most of the ideological governors uh, have been big failures. How do you feel about your role in the uh, Senate? I like it. You know, I've, I, um, I feel like I get up every morning thinking I might have a chance to make the country a little better and go to bed at night thinking I have. I would describe it two ways. You know, there's sort of two tracks up there. People are always coming up to me and saying, I'm glad I don't have your job, you know, and I, and I say, I'm glad you don't either because I like it. <laughs> but there's this track. These are the tweets and Bob Woodward's book and the attacks and all this stuff, cable news, I don't get involved in that. Then there's this track. This is the getting things done track. Like just this week, um, we passed an appropriations bill that I sponsored that makes sure that we stay first in the world in supercomputing. Uh, that, that's it's 10 straight years of working on that. That's very important to our well-being as a country. It's, it's the fourth straight year of uh, support for uh, our national laboratories like the Oak Ridge Laboratory, that's sort of our secret weapon in economics. Um, the, it's a fifth straight year of reconstruction of Chickamauga Lock and Chattanooga. So I can affect that. It also, we approved uh, voting next week on the opioids legislation, which Senator McConnell, the majority leader, calls landmark legislation. Seventy different senators contributing to how we deal with this terrible public health epidemic. And then I've about got passed a songwriter's bill to help songwriters, of which we have a lot in Tennessee, get paid a fair market value for the work they do. That's taken a few years too. So I like doing that. And I can do all of that without being involved in the tweets and the Bob Woodward and the cable news and all that shouting stuff. Sometimes they get mixed up, but not very much. Well, that is, and uh, probably didn't, doesn't get a lot of publicity. Uh, well, that's the good thing about it, because yeah. <laughs> the publicity is not about what I'm doing. It's not about what's going on, and I don't complain about that. I just go on, go ahead and and do the job. the The job of the United States Senate, the the reason we have one, it's not a majority institution. It's a it's an institution that number one respects the rights of the minority, so you have to get 60 of the 100 senators to cut off debate. And it's a place where you work things out so they last for a long time. So in a country that's fragmented like our internet democracy is today, we badly need an institution where people will work across the aisle, come to results that large numbers of people can support, and that won't change every year or two. And that's, that's what we did with uh, the bill fixing No Child Left Behind. Uh, if you're a teacher in Nashville or Maryville, you don't have to worry about elementary and secondary federal policy changing for the next several years because we had a big vote on that, and Democrats as well as Republicans supported it. Who uh, determines which issues you should pursue uh, and those that you should set aside for the time being? Well, that's a great question. The, the, for the whole Senate, it's the majority leader. Uh, the, the leader of the party with the majority in the Senate. He has the prerogative of bringing a bill to the floor. So he sets the agenda. But each of us can decide what to do. Like I don't, the songwriter's issue is not in any committee that I'm on. I just decided I'd been up there 16 years, we've been talking about it and nothing had gotten done. So I got a bunch of people together and said, okay, what can we agree on? And we found that we could agree on a lot uh, the broadcasters are okay with what we're doing, so they're not opposing it. So we've come up with a solution that helps the streaming companies like Amazon that will make it easy for songwriters to get paid and get paid a fair market value. But I picked that out myself uh, because I could do it. It's like Senator McKellar said, it's like being a faculty member at a great university. You can kind of do what you want to do in the United States Senate, and that's one of the advantages of it. But you're, you're a senior senator. Uh, did, you, uh, did you get a lot of deference uh, from the others because of that 
uh, tenure that you have and experience? You not have? much, not much. The, uh, the the rule of the Senate is everyone counts equally. If you're chairman of the committee, it helps. I think it's relevant in a discussion like this uh, what the skills of a lawyer are for a United States senator. Uh, it used to be that lawyers were that most elected officials were lawyers. I know in Blunt County, Maryville, where I grew up, I mean, it's just sort of automatic that the leading lawyers, like the Goddards and the Gambles, were the chairman of the Republican Party. And uh, the leading Democrat was Mr. Kramer, who was a Democrat. <laughs> so he practiced in Knoxville. <laughs> but those were the leading political people in, 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 in the area, and they got elected. But being a lawyer, I found, is a real advantage to, to my work in public life, and maybe not for reasons that people would always expect. I think in law school, you're taught to be able to sift the essence of something from a big mass of stuff. You know, my, my, the freshman year, year in law school to me is, they just throw everything at you and see if you can pull anything out of it, pull the essence out of it. And, and then the second thing is, to be able to, to communicate it, to write, and to persuade half the people you write. I, in law school, I learned to separate the essence from a mass of stuff and to write a clear declarative sentence to persuade and say what I am trying to say. I found that the most useful skills that I have, both as governor and as United States Senator, and I tell the young people who want to come work for me, if you can write a declarative sentence, and if you can pull the essence out of this complex health care issue and, 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 and so that people can know what you're talking about and agree with you, then you're going to be a very valuable member of this staff. And if you can't do that, you're not worth anything. <laughs> and you need to go back to school and learn how to write and how to speak and how to, how to talk. So I think training as a lawyer, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure knowing about laws and how they're made, all that helps too. But I think seeing the essence of a complex situation and persuading half the people you're right are the skills that I learned that are most useful. You've, you've been there long enough to uh, kind of weigh the uh, influence of others, your colleagues in the Senate and so forth. Uh, do you also go around and, uh, and get, try to get as many people gathered around you uh, so that you can either persuade or somehow uh, capture the vote for whatever the issue is at that time? Do well, they the, go around and say we've... There's no mystery there. about the Senate. I mean, just imagine a, a body of 100 people uh, that operates by unanimous consent. Now think about that for a minute. I mean, uh, how, how many organizations do you know of 100 where any one person can stand up and bring the train to a halt. That's the Senate. So it's necessarily based upon relationships. And, and, and so I, I spend my time, and so do most senators, spend their time getting to know one another, uh, being respectful to one another, learning to trust one another, trying to persuade one another. And when we do that, we succeed. For example, in the songwriters bill that I was talking about, we have to get every single senator to approve it, to pass it. Every one? Every single one. One could block it. Now, uh -huh. we could take longer, but if someone objects to it, then it might take a week or two or three on the Senate floor, and we don't have that time, so it wouldn't get passed. So my job has been to go around and get every single senator to agree to it. It was the same thing with the opioids bill. Seventy senators made contributions. I had to get every single senator to agree to it, so we could basically pass it by unanimous consent. So those are the skills that you have, and you can't do that unless people, unless you know each other and trust each other, because you're asking other colleagues, will you please not insist on this, and we'll try to get it for you later? <laughs> or will you please insist on, not insist on this, because the whole bill is more important than what you're trying to accomplish here. So that's, that's the nature of it. It's all human nature. And people who appreciate and understand that do well in it, and people who don't, don't. <laughs> well, I would suspect that you like it and do well in it with your your character. Well, I hope I, I hope I do. I enjoy I it. I mean, I'm sure some are 
you know, they're, they're slinging the hammer around, and it doesn't work well. Some do, but you know, if, if you watch cable television, most of the people who you'll see on there aren't elected to anything. They're just hired guns and political consultants shouting at each other, deliberately trying to make, if you're on the left, to make you mad at the right, or if you're on the right, make you mad at the left. And they're not doing much back in the, in the Senate? Not, not very much, no. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, Okay, what, what are the uh, challenges uh, as you travel between Tennessee and Washington? And uh, I guess how often do you do that? I know you've got a place to stay there. You've got a house here. And well, I don't, uh, we're very fortunate. I, I basically go back and forth either to Knoxville or Nashville. I'm in, uh, I'm in Nashville about a third of the nights during the year and in Maryville about a third of the nights and in Washington about a third of the nights. So uh, I don't travel very much to other states and we're fortunate to have uh, lots of nonstop flights from both those cities to Washington, D.C. So I'm home most weekends. The Senate has changed. Some people say it's for the worse because Congressman Joel Evans, for example, who used to represent the 4th District, a Democrat, committee chairman, well respected, he would drive back and forth to Washington uh, twice a year. And he lived in Washington and he, he would come back home when they were through with their business and live in Tennessee. Uh, Senator Gore Sr. would drive from Washington back to Nashville all night so he could be on Ralph Emery's morning show. Uh, it used to be that senators and congressmen would live in Washington and their kids would go to school there and they'd be neighbors to each other uh, while the Senate was in session and then back in their states while it wasn't. The advent of air service and, and now the instant communication with you know, the internet has senators and congressmen frantically going back and forth to their home to try to get back to explain themselves before somebody else can. And so even the United States senators from the West Coast, like Patty Murray, who lives on an island in Washington state, mm -hmm. she goes back and forth every day. I mean, every weekend. She'll, she'll, she'll get off the island, take a ferry to the mainland, drive to the airport and fly from Seattle to Washington. The senator from Hawaii, Brian Schatz, even goes back to Hawaii most weekends, which is hard for me to imagine. So that's, I'm very fortunate to be an hour away uh, from Washington, D.C. and home most weekends. Well, that is good. The, uh, what changes would, uh, when the president of your party uh, is on the opposite side? What? What, what, what changes, if any, do you, uh, when the president Oh, oh, you mean if, I, if we have a Democratic president when, yes. I'm, when I'm in the... Well, I just finished that, eight years with President Obama. I actually, I actually got a lot done uh, with President Obama, and I guess I learned that as governor. When I was governor, uh, Ned McWhorter was the speaker and John Wilder was the uh, lieutenant governor, and the legislature was Democratic. So if I wanted to have a better schools program or recruit an industry or pass a road bill, um, I had to persuade them, or at least enough of them, to support my point of view. So I think that served me well as a, as a senator. And so uh, with President Obama, we had a Republican majority in the Congress and a Democratic president. And, on, and I'll tell you a story about, about that. I, senator Corker and I went to Knoxville with President Obama in January or February of 2015. And on the way down, we talked about the need to fix No Child Left Behind, all of the issues that had occurred with that federal law, including the Common Core mandate and standardized testing. It was very controversial. And I said, Mr. President, I'm going to try to do this as chairman of the Education Committee, but I'm going to ask you one thing. Will you not oppose what I'm doing until I can come to see you with a proposal? He said yes, and he, agreed, and he did what he said he would do. 
Then about halfway through it, he called me to the White House along with Senator Murray, the Democrat I was working with. He said, I want three things in the bill. And I said, I can do two of them, but I can't, get, I can't pass the third one. But I will make sure it's in the final version or I won't bring you the final version. He said, okay. And I did that and he signed the bill and he called it a Christmas miracle. And, it, and the Wall Street Journal said it was the biggest evolution of power from Washington to the states in 25 years. And on the same trip, we were having a lunch in Knoxville before he made a speech. And he had become interested in precision medicine, which is using the human genome to develop uh, medicines that fit you but not, not, might not fit me. And I said, Mr. President, we'll, we'll tie that into our 21st century cure legislation. And he said, okay. And we worked together on that. And I, everything he had that had to do with precision medicine, I attended. Then Vice President Biden's son died of cancer, and we added the cancer moonshot to it. And so we passed the 21st Century Cures Act uh, the following year uh, with a bipartisan support. And Senator McConnell said it was the most important law of the Congress, and we're seeing the benefits of it today in these medical miracles that are happening all around the Congress. So I was able to work with President Obama on both fixing No Child Left Behind and on 21st century cures by listening to him. And uh, he was good to his word, I was good to mine, and, and we got a result. Uh, is he uh, continuing to be active with the Congress? No, no, I don't. You can't the, tell the, from the, the, the press sometimes. The, no, the tradition of former presidents uh, is that they stay quiet after they leave office. And George W. Bush didn't say a word about Obama for eight years, even though Obama criticized him. And Bush hasn't said anything about Trump, even though President Trump has criticized Bush. Now, I think President Obama's had about all he's going to take. <laughs> and he, after 18 months, he's back out on the campaign. But I've tried to follow that as governor in a smaller way. I, people ask me all the time, what about some state issue? And I say, there's only one governor at a time, and I'm not it. So I've left it to Governor Haslam and Governor Bredesen and Governor Sundquist to make those decisions without me trying to lob in a, you know, a hand grenade from Washington, D.C. Are you getting uh, tired of your uh, Senate position? No, I like it. I hope you can see that I'm enjoying it. And, and I mentioned just this week, I'm literally working on three of, uh, you know, the opioids legislation, which is landmark legislation, according to Senator well, McConnell. Yeah. The songwriter's bill, first time in a generation that we've been able to do anything on it, and then the appropriations process. So um, I like what I'm doing. Well, I'm, I can believe you because I can feel the excitement uh, in you and just uh, talking about what you do when you go to work and the, the challenges, but you've been there long enough to uh, know the end runs, so to speak, and. <laughs> when you should well, I've been there a while. To get, you know, you got to have the first down. I've not been there as long as uh, people think because I've been, you know, when I was elected to the Senate in 2002, I'd been in private life for as long as I'd been in public life. So I've, I've had time, partly by my own design, partly because I lost races of, uh, you know, being in business, of being in law practice, of doing other things. I'm glad I did. You know, I'm glad I wasn't for uninterrupted in public life for, for, uh, for, for 50 years. But, but um, I, like, I like what I'm doing. I'm glad I've had well, that privilege. Well, I, I believe that. I, I was uh, surprised. I knew that you had, had written more than one book, but I saw that you'd written seven books, and uh, that indicates that you uh, enjoy that. Uh, do you do that while you're uh, up staying in Washington by yourself, or do you do that some other time? When do you have time to read book, to write books? Well, each of those books. I, I mean, mean, I know I've seen smaller it, books. Well, each each books. of those books is, you know, a, sort of a project of intense work in itself. And I mean, the first one was called Friends. It was about Japan and Tennessee and I would give copies to the Japanese people we'd see. I got Robin Hood, the Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, to go to Japan for six months 
take pictures of the similarities between their Boy Scouts, our Boy Scouts, their wrestlers, our wrestlers, and then wrote a book. Uh, I wrote a book called Steps Along the Way about my time as governor. It's a scrapbook. I did that while I was governor and I'd, I'd work in the office at night or early in the morning. I wrote my book six months off after I came back from, from Australia. I wrote a book called Lamar Alexander's Little Plaid Book. I got Jackson I've, Brown of Nashville to help me do that. He, he wrote that. Life's Little Instruction Book and he's such a smart, smart guy. Uh, I wrote an afterword to Keel Hunt's book about my early swearing in. The writing I do really has to do with my job because I'm always communicating. I'm always trying to persuade somebody. And so I'm always trying to take, I mean, I'll get a press release from my staff and, and, and I won't like it because it won't be clear what they're talking about. So I'll work on it a little bit and try to, as I was talking, I learned to do in law school, what's the essence of this? How can I write this in a plain declarative sentence so somebody will know what it's talking about and I can persuade them? So most of my writing is, is uh, in connection with my job of trying to persuade my constituents and my colleagues that I'm right about what I'm talking about. Um, are you writing a book now? No. I might sometime in the future. You might, yeah, when you go home I've, from I've thought about I've, I've thought about uh, uh, writing. Um, the last thing I wrote was Keel Hunt wrote the book about my early swearing in. And in the basement, in his basement, after he wrote it, he found my version of the early swearing in that I'd written in 1985, which is six years after the event. So we talked with the Vanderbilt Press about what to do about that, and we decided I would, we would edit that and make it an afterword to a new edition for Keel's book. When does that come out? Last year, 2017. So, so it's Keel's book called Coup, yeah. with an afterword that I wrote about what I remembered about that early swearing in. He did his from a couple of hundred interviews with people. Yeah. I did mine from he sort of, my, my view was from the eye of the storm, and I actually learned a lot about that five hour period from his book because I was like in the eye of the storm. I was sitting there looking out. I was looking at Bill Leach and Hal Harden and John Wilder and Ned McWhorter and thinking about all the legal uh, consequences of what do you do when you take office before you're supposed to take office. And um, I had not heard all of the outside stuff. What, uh, have you, uh, do you have any mind taking off any, uh, any vacations now? Vacations? Um, I like to go fishing in August and that got curtailed. Go to, that got curtailed go this Canada, year because it, Canada. go to Canada to go to fishing. You've been there and, and I like to go fishing. I go with my law school roommate, Barney Haynes, and oh, yeah. we tell the same stories to each other every year. Yeah. Well, that's the, but they get, they, I don't know that they get richer, but. <laughs> They're golden but, oldies. But as old as we are, <laughs> I'm, I'm going down to uh, Memphis for my old, some of the football groups and, and they tell stories and everybody laughs and they said, that, that was you. <laughs> they don't. They, the stories tend to grow sometimes. Uh, do you keep in touch with all these uh, old buddies that you have? Well, you're one of them, uh, Luke Connor, and another. Uh, some of the friends I stay in touch with the most are my law school friends, which is a, a little unusual. I'm not sure why that is, but. Uh, I mean, we're all getting together um, at the first of the year, but includes Barney Haynes, who was a fine lawyer at King and Spalding in, in uh, Atlanta. Is he retired? Completely? He's retired. Paul Tagliabue. Paul was a fine lawyer as well. He practiced at Covington and Burling. He was a lawyer for the National Football League when Pete Rosell retired, and the owners couldn't agree on who to succeed uh, they were in a deadlock. Uh, two factions had a candidate and they couldn't agree so they turned to Paul and that's how he became the the uh, owner of the, I mean the, the commissioner of the NFL. That by the way had some good consequences for Tennessee 
One was, he was the commissioner when the Titans came. And that was a hard sell by Governor Bredesen, who was mayor then, and Governor Sundquist, who was governor. Nashville was a small market. But Paul knew Nashville, and he took a risk and approved the Titans moving from Houston to, to, to Nashville. And more recently, um, uh, he's helped us with uh, MLS soccer. Uh, my son, Will Alexander, and Bill Haggerty uh, appointed themselves to go try to get a soccer franchise for Nashville. And uh, Will was smart enough to get Paul Tagliabue to be his counsel. Turns out the commissioner of the soccer league used to work for Paul Tagliabue at the NFL and the two people who started the soccer league are two of the NFL owners. So Tagliabue's, wow. Tagliabue's respect for Nashville helped the soccer league decide to, to jump Nashville ahead of 12 other cities and get us the soccer league we have. But we, I stay in touch with, with, those, with those friends as well when, as uh, When they others. asked me to do this, uh, I was at home thinking about you, but that, what, how much time it was going to take and that sort of thing. And, and I mentioned uh, our trip, to, uh, uh, well, going up with, with Paul telling us about taking, Will went, John went, and it was a football game. And uh, These and are our sons for yeah, people who and, are watching. Uh, and, <laughs> and John wasn't there, he was in another room, but he came out there and he said, yeah, Paul Tagliabue. <laughs> And he remembered that, oh. taking taking the boys into the the, uh, the the place where the people were advertising. I mean, uh, they were not advertising; they were talking about all the, the game, mm -hmm. and let them go there. So he then went through and you know spent all the time other other things that they did uh, during that time. Uh, so, how much quote time off do you have, and uh, how do you fill it? What, what, what do you, well, you, you go you fishing, know, but that's kind of once a year probably. My, my, that is once a year. That's in August. I, I, I go quail shooting in Texas and it's warmer in, in February. Um, you know, I, f I feel my, t I'm, I like to, I get consumed with what I do. So I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking or working on something that related to the Senate. What I, I like to read um, I love sports. The only television I watch is ESPN or any sports game. Uh, I go to UT football games. I go to Vanderbilt baseball games <laughs> when I can. Um, uh, so, so, and I've become a Nationals fan a little bit in the last few in the last few uh, last few years. Sure. So sports, fishing, and we spend a lot of time family wise. Uh, we're lucky to have three of our children and many of our grandchildren in Nashville. So they're here. And our New York family uh, is moving in with us in East Tennessee for three or four months in about uh, three weeks while their house is being remodeled in Westchester oh, wow. County, New York. And those grandsons are gonna be attending Walland Elementary School. So we'll, we'll have a clash of cultures right there that'll be good for <laughs> everybody concerned. So family football sports, Reading. What are you friends. reading now? Are you um, in, in any novels now? You know, or not, not novels. Novel? On the on the uh, when I go fishing, I try to read um, uh, things I don't usually read. I like Emily Dixon Dickinson's poems, and I read those. I especially like the one where she says, uh, "I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too?" Tell your name the live long day. Uh, I, I'm, so I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. To tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. <laughs> <laughs> but back, back home, uh, I'm reading a book by, I think his name is Fergus Brodovich or something like that, on the first Congress uh, that met in New York and Philadelphia. And what I see there is that nothing's changed uh, except technology. I mean, now we know everything every 13 seconds, but human nature hadn't changed. 
I'm reading a book, John Meacham's book, The Soul of America, which is good. We're lucky to have him in Tennessee. He grew up in Tennessee. It basically says, we've seen this all before and we've survived it. Yeah. The most interesting book um, is, is uh, Senator Kenneth McKellar's book about his predecessors. You know, he was elected six terms. Senators used to be chosen by the legislature, and that's a whole nother story. I mean, those were rawdy affairs. I can't imagine what went on. They'd sometimes have 84 ballots down in the Hermitage Hotel or wherever they were. But McKellar was elected in 1916 for six terms, more than anybody popularly elected. And he wrote about all the previous senators in great detail and to read the history of the people who served in the Senate, starting with Andrew Jackson and people like that all the way to McKellar has been very, very interesting for me. So I, I like Tennessee history. I like history and I enjoy reading that. We're coming to the end of our time. It's been delightful for, for us and we hadn't had a chance to talk like this in a while, but it's, uh, you've got other things to do. And uh, is there anything else that uh, you think would be worthwhile to, to tell us uh, about this or anything else that you feel uh, that you'd like us to know? Well, I think, I think you've covered it very well, Robert. The, the, uh, here, here's what I'd like to, to say. The, I mentioned earlier that my dad took me when I was 10 to meet Howard Baker Sr. at the courthouse, and I thought that he was the most respected man I was ever likely to meet other than my father and the preacher. So I was raised to respect people in public life and the value of public life. Um, and I was raised to respect especially people in the law, you know, like the Joe Gambles and the Mose Gambles and the Houston Goddards and the A.B. Goddards. That's the way I was raised. I still have that feeling. And I think it's important to convey to young people, especially today, that there's a right way to do things and there's a respect that you can have for people uh, in public life and in the law. There's an honorable profession that we, um, that we have a system of government that most countries in the world would die to have and that we have a remarkable country. We make 24% of all the money in the world for just 5% of the people in the world and that we should do something with it, we do something with it. And that one way to do something with it is to serve in public life for part, of your, for part of your life. So I hope that when people think of whatever I've been able to contribute, they, they, they see that I've gotten up every day, tried to do something to make the state and the country a little better, gone to bed at night thinking I have. And I hope that's an example for them, and if they remember anything about me, it would be an, an example of respect for the law and respect for uh, public life. Well, I sense that uh, from you uh, because that's, uh, that's just who you are. But uh, lots of people, and I wonder sometimes too, about the, uh, the friction between the Democrats and the Republicans and how ugly that seems to be growing. Do you, do you sense that? Do you're close to it? Sure, sure I sense it and I see it and I don't like it. Uh, particularly if your job is to work with other people to get a result. But I think what's important for people to understand and I think this takes us back to John Meacham's book called The Soul of America. There's nothing new about that. I mean, uh, only if you don't know any history do you yeah. think that's new. I mean, the only thing that's different is the technology. I mean, the things Washington and Jefferson and Adams all said about each other and that people said about them are just as bad as anything said today. If you go look at what Parson Brownlow, the future governor and senator from Tennessee, said on the public square in Nashville about Andrew Johnson, make Trump's tweets look like Sunday school missives. Um, even in more recent times, uh, I mean, Senator Baker had to serve with terrible debates about the Panama Canal, about women's rights. I mean, we've lived through the civil rights um, episodes that were bloody and mean. 
um, the Vietnam War and people coming home from Vietnam being spit on, even though they were veterans fighting for us. So we've had division and dissension in our country, and we've survived it all. And what makes it survive is we still have people who, are, who conduct themselves properly and who strengthen the institutions that makes our country work, which are those legal institutions like the Senate, like the Supreme Court, and like the presidency. I heard Clarence Thomas speak last year, Justice Thomas in a private setting, and someone asked him, how do you and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg reconcile your considerable differences? And he said, we try to remember that our opinions are less important than the institution. And I've tried to take that back to the United States Senate and say that to Democrats and Republicans there, that our opinions are less important than the institution. We need for the institution to be strong and we need for people within the institution to conduct themselves properly. Well, I'm glad you're there. Thank you for uh, your time this morning. And uh, it's, we've taken up uh, more than our, uh, I guess we're entitled to. But it's been fun for me, good to see you, and thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you very much.